Great. Yep. Are we all here? Yep. Yep. Wow. Jim, you wouldn't believe this interview Greg just gave me. It's just astonishing. Absolutely fucking astonishing. Every time I talk to him, he blows my mind. It's un fucking unbelievable. I cannot believe it. <laughs> well, yeah, but it, most of the information is so far out, it's incredulous to most people. Well, I'm telling you, he explained it so beautifully today, I understood it better than I ever have before, I'll tell you. But I will say that everything he's ever told me that I checked out, it turns out to be right. So. Can you guys go on video? Can I see you? I'll get, I'll get us on the air. Yeah. This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, with my very special guest. Again, you've heard him in the past from New Zealand. Today he is living in Europe, actually in the UK. He has written many books, very controversial, fascinating stuff. Greg Hallett, welcome back to The Real Deal. Thanks, Jim. It's been a while. It's been, uh, hey. it's been a while and it's been a journey. Uh, I can't believe you let mere assassination attempts drive you out of New Zealand. <laughs> Well, you know, it was the twelfth one, and I thought, you know, the thirteenth is just striving to be a bit too lucky. So yes, um, yes. I, um, the Rugby World Cup was having its opening ceremony, so I escaped on that day because all the security was um, busy and focused inward uh, on the games and not on, on people leaving the country. So. Um, I literally escaped. I got I got driven to the airport by someone who knows what they're doing, and um, got seen onto the airplane. And it was uh, it was a great relief to leave. There was an enormous amount of pressure on me. Um, so I left in uh, left on the 9th of September 2011, uh, which was the opening of the World Cup, and on the 1st of June 2011. A potential witness for the case, uh, Errol John Hinksman, um, was murdered. Uh, which was interesting because the um, some friends of his went to visit him and they had, uh, I'm not sure if I've told you this already, but they had half a bottle of beer in their hand and there's a, a drinking ban in the inner city. And he lived um, right next to Merrill Park, which is about 200 metres north of the, or 200 metres up the hill from the town, uh, town hall. Um, and so they, they just went on a casual visit and they were chased by police officers on foot for 45 minutes up and down alleyways. For having a, a, a can of beer? Yeah, which is like, you know, let's say, you know, a $40 fine. Um, but they were chasing everyone away from the area. Now, Errol John Hinksman wasn't a methamphetamine user and he was very tidy. And when he was murdered, he was found to have had a methamphetamine overdose, and his place was a mess. So he was so, he was killed. Errol John Hinksman was killed, and he was one of Peter Williams' tight ten in the heroin trafficking. Errol John Hinksman was um, one of the ones in charge of collecting heroin debts. So heroin users that owed money um, so, would you know would would be confronted by Errol John Hinksman. He was about uh, in his early sixties when it happened, when he died, when he was. So killed. he was he was an enforcer. Yeah. By that time, he was a tall, skinny guy. Um. So what what, what was the reason to think he was going to be a witness uh, yeah, against well, Williams? Well, I lived I lived um, just across um, uh, My, My, Myers Park from him, um, so we were virtually neighbours. We would have been hundred metres door to door. And if he had managed to be a witness on my behalf, it would have been the demise of Peter Williams, and it would have been the demise of the New Zealand judiciary that's been protecting Peter Williams QC, his heroin trafficking, his murders, um, and Peter Williams has been using pedophilia to control uh, judges, and he's got his uh, common-law wife, Henny Phillips, doing scat which is defecation, ritualistic defecation, on um, judges, lawyers, and reporters. So they've managed to get a strong... You mean literally? This, yeah, is not literally. Figured, this is not a form of performance art. This is doing a, <laughs> yeah, a, is, a, a, a sexual ritual, a bizarre yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, sex shit, scat. Um, 
So with that amount of shame involved, they had um, total control. So he was allowed to not answer any questions and um, uh, not present any evidence um, and actually have the case heard in my absence. I had eight murder attempts in New Zealand and I left the country in March 2010, um, returned in September 2010. And um, during that time, the New Zealand judiciary had the case against me heard uh, in my absence with all my evidence suppressed and with um, no notification to me of the hearing. And um, the uh, District Court of Auckland and the High Court of Auckland stopped notifying me by email four months either side of the hearing. So I didn't even know that it had happened. And it was when I'd come back to New Zealand for a month, they, they saw that I'd been um, uh, noticed enough around town um, to appear to have been present previously when I was overseas. Um, so they published the results of the hearing in the paper, which I then um, appealed. And when I appealed the hearing, Peter Williams had a um, retired police inspector called Winston West uh, in a full motorcycle suit and helmet. Um, jump on my parked car, my, my Mercedes had already been blown up so I was in a loan car, a Honda Civic, which is a very small car, and he, he ripped the rear vision mirror off the, the car and he ripped the wiper blade and arm off the car, and this was outside the Auckland High Court in broad daylight. Now what in God's name was he doing? Well he was working for Peter Williams. But, but I mean this was supposed to be a form of intimidation? Yeah, I just won the right to appeal the case that I wasn't invited to. So he was telegraphing a message that you're uh, you're uh, running some risks, that you're doing some things they would not want you to do. Yeah. Was, P was Peter Williams the, the, the PM at this point? No, he was he was a Queen's Council lawyer and he was the legal Queen's head of the Mr. Asia Heroin Trafficking Syndicate, which was trafficking heroin rampantly from uh, early 1970 to um, 1979 when a lot of them got caught, including his own junior lawyer. Um, <clears throat> but the, Peter Williams had actually been trafficking heroin since at least the early 1960s, according to Army Intelligence. But um, I've got information that he was trafficking heroin at least from 1954. And that was coming uh, from South America inside Phillips fluorescent light tubes. And... Um, um, they'd break open the light tubes in a house in Waihe, which is about, then it was about five hours drive south of Auckland, now it's about an hour and a half. And housewives were breaking it open, getting the powder out and sending the uh, cartons back to Phillips in Holland as a measure to supposedly improve their packaging, but really it was a measure of how much heroin had come through. So the Queen of Holland... Um, so the, I think it was Juliana at the time, she was actually involved in heroin trafficking with her husband, uh, Prince Bernard, who was a, um, a very close friend of Prince Philip. Uh, it's interesting that Peter Williams admitted in the High Court of Auckland that he was Prince Philip's agent in New Zealand. So we're dealing with royal heroin trafficking. Oh. That's fairly stunning, isn't it? I suppose not surprising, all things considered, given the CIA is the biggest drug-running operation in the world today. Yeah, and that's sort of under the umbrella of the American government, and you can't touch it, and they're all above the law. So the drug trafficking is done en masse by people who are above the law, which is the intelligence agencies, Queen's Councils, and the um, um, royal families. Now, the, the, um, the British royal family is actually uh, fake. It's a fraud. It's flat lie royal. It's been an illegitimate royal family since at least 1901, 1902. But really, it's been an illegitimate flat lie royal, non-royal family since um, 1852. And is this because of genetic interruptions that it's the wrong gene line, given it's supposed to be an hereditary monarchy? No, um, it's because of this. Queen Victoria had a firstborn son before King Edward VII. 
and that son, whose name is Marcos Manuel, he was born in wedlock legitimately, and he's the true king of England, and his descendants are the true king of England, the true monarchs of England. So why did they finesse, why did they skip him for the sake of Edward? So they could run the British Empire as a mafia. Please elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah. right. um, I mean, what, 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 you know, if you got a legitimate heir, you'd think you'd ha allow him to ascend to the crown. Yeah, well, that's what we're trying to do. I've, I've actually been adopted into the true royal family. I was adopted on the summer solstice of 2010, and again on Leap Day 2012. So um, that's actually on video um, in the form of a knighthood elevating me to Lord Chancellor of the True Prince of Wales um, and it's on the worldoftruth.net so if you go to that website the worldoftruth.net you can see the knighthood and the sword we're using is the sword of King Dom Fernando II who is the most popular king of Portugal and that sword was given to him by Duke Ernst II Sax Coburg and Gotha who was the premier duke of the Saxe Coburg and Gothas, from which the um, well, his younger brother was Prince Consort Albert, who was married to Queen Victoria. So, even Duke Ernst II knew that we were the true royal family. Now, I use the royal we because I'm adopted. That's just kind of an advantage. <laughs> um, so, uh, the sword was given. Uh, from memory, the date was uh, 10th of June, 1869. Um, the sword was given to us and then passed down through the family um, and it's one of about 32 royal marks we've got more but we're presenting around about 32 33 royal marks uh, showing that uh, the family I've been adopted into is the true royal family so I'm in England at the moment I've been here three or four months and I'm acting as um, proxy as stand-in for the true monarch and the true Prince of Wales. And we've been working on this story now for about two and a half years. Well, I imagine it would make quite a sensation if it were revealed to the British public. Well, that's what we're doing. We've got, we've got one book here that's a very early edition of it, The Hidden King of England. The Hidden King of England, yes. Right. And... Um, uh, and, the and the photograph on the cover there is... That, the that's Marcus Manuel when he's 16. Yeah. Um, photographed in the Azores. Um, and he's actually surrounded in what's called the menorah position where he's centerpiece in, in, in um, two triangles, one inverted and one upright. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, he ended up living with his mother, Queen Victoria, on the Isle of Wight from the age of 16 to 21 or 22 um, and he was literally the gardener as in Chauncey Gardener as in Boy Chance as in Being There in Peter Sutton's oh. movie Being There Yes. now Being There is actually a direct parody of Marcos Manuel um, and Peter Sellers had inside knowledge and here's how it went Queen Victoria's youngest daughter was Princess Beatrice and Princess Beatrice was Queen Victoria's secretary and Princess Beatrice was in charge of editing Queen Victoria's letters and diaries and what they did was remove any mention of Marcos Manuel and any mention of his father George who was blind Prince George of Cumberland, who became blind King George V of Hanover. He was married to Queen Victoria on the 18th of September, 1833. And they, uh, Marcus Manuel was born on the 25th of April, 1834. Now, Princess Beatrice was married to uh, Prince Battenberg, whose brother was Prince Louis of Battenberg, whose son was Lord Louis Mountbatten, who was the most prominent, mm, how do you say, prominent non-royal, um, 
He was assassinated in 1979. Um, and that also relates to heroin trafficking. Um, so, Princess Beatrice was editing Queen Victoria's diaries. She would tell her husband, who would tell his brother, who would tell his son, Lord Louis Mountbatten. Now, Lord Louis Mountbatten's father, Prince Louis Battenberg, had an illegitimate child with um, Lily Langtree, who was a famous actress. She was also the mistress to King Edward VII. <clears throat> now, Lord Louis Mountbatten also had an illegitimate child with an actress, and that child's name is Peter Sellers. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's 25 miles from Broadlands where Lord Louis Mountbatten lived, which is a mansion in about um, 5,000 acres. And uh, he used to go down to Portsmouth and <clears throat> play the bongos and bands and uh, get small cameo acting parts. And he had a sexual relationship with um, um, Peg Marks, Peg Sellers, Peg Knee Marks Sellers. And Peg Sellers had just had a... Um, uh, um, uh, a stillborn boy called Peter. So Lord Louis conceived a child with her, and that child was called Richard Sellers, Richard Henry Sellers. But it was always called Peter, and that's how you get Peter Sellers. All right? But Richard, short for Richard, is Dickie. And Lord Louis Mountbatten became known as Dickie Mountbatten. All right? So. Lord Louis Mountbatten gets his nickname Dickie from his son Peter, whose actual name was Richard. <laughs> Isn't that <funny>? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Believe me, that's easier written down. Um, so I, 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 I presume Peter Sellers was aware of his lineage? Yeah, Lord Louis Mountbatten used to brief him. And when Princess Beatrice Battenberg briefed her husband, my husband's brother, who, who briefed his son, which was Lord Louis Mountbatten. So Lord Louis Mountbatten was the nephew of Princess Beatrice. And he would then brief his son, his illegitimate son, Peter Sellers. Um, and Peter Sellers, when he was born, just before he was born, he moved to a very nice apartment overlooking a mile of green and then the sea, overlooking Portsmouth, all the shipping coming in and over to the Isle of Wight, which is where Queen Victoria lived. So he was always... Um, intrigued really by the Isle of Wight and Queen Victoria and what went on there. Now Being There was the second to last movie that Peter Sellers made and it was um, the last movie that he got to see. Um, Lord Louis Mountbatten was assassinated on the 27th of August 1979. Exactly 12 weeks later uh, Being There screened and then, almost exactly seven months later, Peter Sellers died of a heart attack. And then, um, 21 years after that, um, Princess Margaret died. Um, now, 21 will become uh, important later on. Peter Sellers had an affair with Princess Margaret. And you can't have an affair with a royal, unless you've got strong royal connections or royal blood or something close. That's how it was then. It's a bit less now with um, Commoner Kate and uh, the foe Prince William. She's impressed me tremendously. Who? Princess Margaret? No, Kate. Really? Kate Middleton. Oh, well. <clears throat> um, so what, what Peter Sellers did in the movie Being There was do a complete parody of Marcos Manuel living on the Isle of Wight. So much so, and so clear is the parody, that he inserts, uh, he's got a lot of TV on there, he watches a lot of TV in the movie, and all of the TV is pertinent. He's even got a basketball team standing there with their numbers on their T-shirts, and the numbers are the birth date of Marcos Manuel and the age in which he went to the Isle of Wight to stay with his mother, Queen Victoria. 
So what, what Peter Sellers left us with was a codification. He was a Freemason, so the rule amongst the Freemasons is to hide things in plain sight. And what Peter Sellers did was, was reveal to us the true story as far as he knew it from Princess Beatrice's letters, Queen Victoria's letters, copied by Princess Beatrice, edited by Princess Beatrice, with the good stuff going to her nephew, Lord Louis Mountbatten, and to his son, Peter Sellers. Um, so that's, that's how we've... Um, that's how we've got a, uh, a public mark available to everyone um, of Queen Victoria's firstborn son's existence. In being there. In the movie being there, 1979. Yes. Um, Peter's, death, Peter's death was of natural causes, was it not? Yeah, it was a massive heart attack. Uh, he'd had heart attacks before. Um, but, yeah, he, he died. Um, He's one of the most brilliant comic actors I ever saw. Well, I actually think he acted like a piece of cardboard. Uh, <laughs> so we can disagree well, it's on part that. of his shtick, you know. I mean, he had this manner. It was so stunning and hilarious. Yeah, maybe for its time. But, yeah, no, that's okay. That's okay. I think, you know, like a lot of actors who are related to the royals, they're, they're advanced um, like Sarah Bernhardt, Lily Langtree, Noel Coward, and uh, Peter Sellers, the, their careers are all advanced and they end up with this enormous filmography because they've got some relationship with the royals. And Noel Coward has a relationship with the royals because he had a homosexual affair with um, uh, the Duke of Kent, King Edward VIII, and uh, from memory I think it was also King George VI. Noel Coward had homosexual affairs with those two. Yeah, when when uh, the Duke of Kent died, he actually faked his death, but when he died, I think it was the 19th of August, 1942, he was a cross-dresser and a, and a uh, morphine addict. Um, and uh, Noel Coward had a lot of letters from the Duke of Kent, who was King George VI's brother, uh, which were essentially love letters so they had to be extracted. And um, Noel Coward's career was already heavily promoted because he's having a sexual affair with the royal. Um, but his, his career was even further promoted. Yep. <laughs> so the royals were making a difference even in Peter Sauer's career? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He had basically carte blanche. He, he even did skits with um, Princess Margaret for film and TV. With Princess Margaret herself, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Princess Margaret was, um, she had a, uh, a sexual liaison with two West Indian men at the same time. And that was photographed and it was kept in a uh, bank vault, uh, Lloyd's bank vault. And that was, uh, that bank vault was raided um, let me see, I'll just, I'll just find the exact date on that. Um, and um, the photos were, were captured. So Princess Margaret had a certain enthusiasm for sex? Uh, yeah, she did, and she liked sex with black men. So it was on the 11th of September 1971 uh, when a gang robbed the um, Lloyds Bank in London. And they actually produced photos of Princess Margaret having sex with two West Indian men. And then it was um, Lord Louis Mountbatten who was asked to come forward. And he brought the bank robbers um, new identities, new passports. And they were allowed to keep the money. And uh, they were allowed to escape out of England without harassment. On the, on the condition they returned the photographs and filmed. On the condition that they return those photographs and film, yeah, and there was more more photographs of aristocracy that the police had, which were also in those bank vaults. And um, British aristocracy never even came to claim them. <laughs> so they're all, you know, transgender stuff. Greg, we're going to take our first break. Jim Fetzer, your host on the Real Deal, with my special guest from the UK, Greg Hallett. We'll be right back.
This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal with my special guest from the UK, Greg Hallett. We're learning things you never, ever thought you'd ever know about the Royals. Greg. So, so I've been working on this book for about um, two and a half years with the true Prince of Wales, um, helping them with their family tree and helping to um, uh, uncover the meanings of the royal marks that's been handed down to them. And these are these royal marks include the rings of queens and the swords of kings, um, photographs of Marcos Manuel, the hidden king of England, um, and uh, his his um, family tree dating back to Queen Victoria and um, blind Prince George of Cumberland. That was the status when, when they married. Now, when Queen Victoria married, so Marcos Manuel was legitimate, he was born in wedlock, and then he was hidden. And there is a history every now and then of hiding kings, and they, they tend to be um, buried in what's called a Siva Lingam, which is a um, sort of a dome, dome, short dome with straight sides, um, not square, round, um, grave. Um, and I was I was given the uh, sword of Duke Ernest II, and the sword of um, King Dom Ferdinand II of Portugal um, on Leap Day, uh, 2012. So on the 29th of February 2012, and I was told to sleep with the sword and then hold it up to the castle in the morning. I'm a late sleeper, so morning for me was midday. <laughs> I, I just made it. You know? So I got up there and I held You had to the, make it before noon. Yeah, I made it before noon. I got up there and it was a, it was a beautiful day and I held the, um, held the sword up to um, Pina Castle, which is a castle in Sintra in Portugal, uh, 20 kilometres northwest of Lisbon. That's where King Dom Fernando II lived. And uh, so that was the 1st of March, and uh, that same day I was, uh, I was elevated in a ceremony with that sword to um, Lord Chancellor. Um, and that's on um, theworldoftruth.net as well. It's a video about 10 minutes long. So that was the, the, the 1st of March I held the sword up to Pina Castle, and on the 11th of March... I went for a walk up to the castle and I found the Siva Lingam. I found the grave of um, the hidden king, Marcos Manuel, and it had been missing for 102 years. Really? Yeah. How, 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 did, how did you happen to just stumble over it? I'm very good at getting lost and finding things. That's really <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> so, um, so I photographed it and then... Um, Presented it to the true Prince of Wales, and uh, did some analysis on it, and then he brought a royal mark, which was an etching um, done around 1852, 1850. It was done in 1850, December 1850, um, by King Dom Ferdinand II of Portugal, and it's a brilliant etching, and it had been missing for about two years and they'd never analyzed that raw mark so they they got the raw mark they got that mark and we analyzed it and, and there's a central figure in it and, and i said that's a blind man and francisco the true prince of wales francisco goes oh how could we not see it you know so it was blind prince george of cumberland blind blind king george the uh king george V of hanover um, so then the whole genealogy of Marcos Manuel was actually in this etching. And the etching showed the Siva Lingam. So then we compared the Siva Lingam with the etching, and it was, it was a, a very good representation. All right? So we had That's a confirmation. Really quite something. So we had a confirmation from um, uh, King Dom Ferdinand II of Portugal that this was the place where Marcos Manuel would be buried. This was the Siva Lingam. And Siva Lingam is a place where you bury secret kings and, and hidden kings. Perfect. So the etching tied it all together, 
genealogically. Yeah, well, his, see, historically and even physically. Oh, absolutely, and it marks a place as well. Yes. It marks a place and it marks a time because it was known um, by December 1850, uh, and Marcus Manuel was actually murdered. He was murdered by his younger brother um, on the 1st of April 1910, and his younger brother was King Edward the Seventh. Right, King Edward the Seventh was the king from 1901-1902 to 1910, and after he murdered his brother, he died uh, five weeks later. Exactly five weeks later. Of natural causes. Uh, yeah, well, he's incredibly fat. King Edward VII was five foot tall and four foot around. He had a four foot waist, 1.22 meters. <laughs> so he's always he's always portrayed as this, you know, tall, large figure. But he's well, do you well, weigh really, 300 really, or 400 or more pounds? He was a legal he midget. He was a legal midget, and he was all just on the border, and. Uh, he was just this round roly-poly man who was in, incredibly vicious. He was an, an incredibly distasteful man. Um, so he murdered his older brother because King Edward VII didn't particularly want to die with his older brother saying, yeah, I've been the king all along. King Edward VII is a fake. So the fake king, Edward VII, murdered his older brother, the true and hidden king, Marcus Manuel. King Edward VII was illegitimate, and Marcus Manuel was the only legitimate royal of Queen Victoria's. So, the only. So the only. The only. The only. The only one. Well, Queen Victoria knew there were a lot of machinations happening around her. So she got on first, um, conceived a child, married and gave birth to a legitimate prince. And that legitimized her as a princess and a queen. Um, prince Consort Albert was homosexual. Whom she, queen Victoria then married Prince Consort Albert bigamously. And he was a homosexual who actually wore what's, what the gays called the Prince Albert which is a chain around your waist and through the foreskin, so you, your penis is always vertical, but you can't conceive, right? So Prince yeah. Consort Albert didn't conceive any of Queen Victoria's children. All of Queen Victoria's children were conceived by Lionel Nathan Rothschild. What, would that, that device you described mean you couldn't perform intercourse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Um, Lionel Nathan Rothschild was known as the King of Kings because he financed virtually all of the monarchies in Europe and even some in Asia. So he had breeding rights and he had breeding rights with Queen Victoria and conceived all of Queen Victoria's children, which made them all bigamously born illegitimate batards. That's what bastards are called and amongst royalty they're called batards. So that's carried on to today, so the royal family we have today is all batard, and the term for that is flat lie royal. Hello, Jim. I'm with you. <laughs> um, it's, it's just astonishing, yeah. right? I mean, the whole history is just utterly astonishing. Yeah. Now there was a uh, move. There was a move. There's, there's actually this goes back to about um, 17, 17, 17, I think it was. There was um, a letter written where um, Amschel Mayor Rothschild, who was the father of Nathan Mayor Rothschild, he said that the true royal, basically this is what he said, he said that the true royal family could come back on the throne uh, 200 years after his death. So we've had a fake royal family from at least 
25th of April 1852 to now, so that the Mafia could take over the, usurp the royal family, take over, utilize the royal family, knowing that they're illegitimate batards, bigmously born, so that the, the Mafia essentially became the government under Lord Palmerston, who was Queen Victoria's Prime Minister. And that is due to end on the 19th of September 2012. That's not too far off. No. No, it's not. It's about, I don't know, eight weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks. So what is going to happen? Well, um, this is called the Shin. And the Shin means the forbidden secret. And um, I've, I've basically inherited the role to run the Shin, to run the forbidden secret. And that's actually somewhat predicted by Peter Sellers that the person who uncovers this would come from New Zealand, which is the opposite side of the planet to where it's happening. And the um, Queen Victoria and his psychics also seem to predict it. So what Prince Philip did with Peter Williams was supply heroin into the areas that I was living in, and I was the target. Um, got to my brothers and sisters, but it didn't get to me. And it was just rampant right through the North Shore where I lived. And there's a, there's a theory that one of the psychics predicted that, because Queen Victoria was using psychics from the age of 19, so from um, 1937, 38. Um, one of the predictions is that the person who uncovers the secret will come from the opposite side of the planet. And New Zealand's the opposite side of the planet to Portugal. Uh, so the person will come from the opposite side of the planet north. So a lot of the heroin was, was uh, targeted into the areas called north. North Island, North Auckland, North Shore. And I lived um, on the North Island of New Zealand, um, north of Auckland, and then on the North Shore in North Coat, went to North Coat Intermediate, and I lived on North Grove Ave, and then I moved to North Harbour. <laughs> they still didn't get me. <laughs> so, um, now, I'm, I'm Portuguese. Uh, my uh, great-grandfather and great-grandmother are both Portuguese. Um, so, you know, it was only natural that I would end up in Portugal and then um, Queen Victoria's great-great-great-great-great-grandson, who is the legitimate heir to the throne, uh, he lives in Portugal. Um, we lost a word there, Greg. We lost a word there. Who's the legitimate? He's the um, the great, 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 five greats, yeah. grandson of Queen Victoria, who is the legitimate head of the throne. When you see the family tree, he's the legitimate head of the throne. He lives in Portugal. So um, we contacted each other uh, in about in 2009 and he wasn't sure who one of his uh, five great grandparents were or six great grandparents were you know six generations so um, I managed to fill him in and give him some background on that and then he sent me um, photographed and I could see from the photograph who he was so um, I said I'll see you in two weeks so um, having had about eight murder attempts in New Zealand, it wasn't very hard to leave. <laughs> and, you know, the overall mission was for me to get to Portugal and, and um, make sure, ascertain that this person was the true descendant um, of Queen Victoria. And so he spent probably six weeks. We sat next to each other for six weeks working on the computer, taking photographs. 
and analyzing objects and he would um, bring in royal objects handed down from Queen Victoria or another monarch um, or another duke and so we went through about uh, I think it was about 26 royal marks we photographed them and analyzed them and we um, compared them against two dictionaries of symbolism to see that the marks on them um, uh, were the true royal marks uh, going back into the families that they claim to be from and so we succeeded in that it took us about six weeks to really um, develop it into I think it was about a 220 page book then and we had about 200 photographs in the book um, of these royal marks and then um, then I went to London and met you on the 6th of July 2010 Yes, yes, yes. Now, in between that, I went to uh, Roslyn Chapel and uh, delivered the Holy Grail to Roslyn Chapel uh, on four four occasions in, in May 2010. And I met an American psychic woman there who accompanied me on the last trip to Roslyn Chapel. And... and uh, it turned out they were both heading to the same location in Wales, uh, to a castle in Wales. So I can drive on the left, she can't, so we drove down to, to Wales. And um, the person in Wales that we stayed with is quite likely, well, the most likely person to be, the, well he is actually, he is, he definitely is. He's the direct line descendant to the um, Prince of Wales from the 1400s. He was the last Welsh Prince of Wales. So that was kind of interesting. So I know I know two Prince of Wales. Um, one in Portugal, who's who's head of the throne of England, um, Scotland, Ireland, um, and is Prince of Hanover, and the other one who's the true um, Prince of Wales. And you're quite convinced the fellow in Portugal is the legitimate... Oh, there's just no question. We've got... Um, put it this way. Have you got to wind up for the next segment, have you? No. Okay. No, we got to... We, we, we'll, we'll, we'll have a minute or two. We got okay. a few minutes before. Well, I, t I took a bit of a film crew down there uh, to Portugal in March. And um, we gave the, the, the film guy um, probably about seven days' notice. Maybe... maybe five or four at the, at the least so and I already know him so he comes down and he films us at dinner chatting away on a, on a small camera and it's very casual and it's great film footage and we're talking at a you know at a good pace like you know as you'd have a conversation with friends and uh, five o'clock the next day I was just so sick I was actually sitting next to the fire roaring like a lion absolutely delirious I managed to get up to the hotel room and I was just face planted on the bed for three days. And the um, the hidden king of England, uh, Francisco, he was he was the same, you know. And the film guy was fine. Had you been poisoned? Oh, absolutely. There's just no question, no question. And then we got about let's say seventy five percent well, three quarters well, um, the day before the film guy left. So the film guy had done it. So no, so so the, the film guy got a lot of background footage. He got us having a conversation at dinner, but when it came to the main interviews, we were just like we were just talking like at about this fast and not really thinking yeah. too well, you know. So yeah. it was just too slow to edit, you know. Had so, he had he set it up? Do you think he was the one who drugged you? Oh no, no, not at all, not at all. Okay. I, I know oh. him really well. He's a great friend, you know. He's okay. He's a top friend. We we hang out a lot and have a lot of fun together. And he's well. Good. Who had access to your food or drink that well, could have done? See, another thing is we we were, we were sitting in a restaurant, um, and we just had spies all over us. You know, we we would sit in an empty restaurant, and then a uh, couple of a spy would come in and sit down. And he'd have a camera in a bag, and he'd sit at the table, just like behind us with the bag and the camera and the bag pointing at us and then he'd go for a walk and come back and and then other another two spies would come in and chat to him and leave and then where we left all the, the spies were 
<laughs> running up and down the street after us. So we seen, we got outside and the spies were all there. So we sent the film guy to walk down the street. And then we sent um, Queen Victoria's descendant to drive after him. And then they drove ahead and then I walked past the spies walking back to find me. <laughs> it, was just, it was just like, it was really bad spy work. Um, but, you know, we were poisoned. We, it actually took me about four months to get over it. And I was actually in hospital for two days. And I think that that was the cause of it. I was in hospital three months later, actually, in early June. In absolute, absolute agony. And I was just, you know, I was just like screaming in pain. And I was just wondering if, if all the uh, poisons had somehow coagulated. How, how was being in the hospital the cause of it? No, no, I had to go to hospital because of the Yeah, pain. yeah, yeah, as a consequence, right, yeah. right, right. Because this, this, this... I mean, you weren't being maltreated in the hospital. Oh, no, no, I went to hospital because I was just like, I was in, yeah. just in agony. In, in, like, in like, anguish, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, you know, I was screaming the hospital down. I was free, you know, it was an absolute agony. I was on massive amount of morphine to shut me up. <laughs> I hear doctors rave about morphine. That it's well, you know, God's I'm, greatest yeah. gift. Oh, yeah, it's, it was definitely a godsend then. Um, so, you know, the question is then, why would they poison us if they didn't think that um, Francisco was the legitimate monarch to the throne of England? Could these be agents of the crowd? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, like the, the British royal family can virtually uh, engage to their ends any intelligence agency across the globe. I mean, they wouldn't be too pleased with having the throne contested. Well, it's interesting because um, we did another video on the 2nd of August 2010, which is um, um, about three weeks after you, um, I did that interview with you in London. And um, we delivered a letter to David Cameron at 10 Downing Street um, requesting him to facilitate the changeover of the monarchy as we were the legitimate royal family. And I had the, um, the Hidden King of England book um, just 20 copies done, just as a, as a, as a tester, to see what the reaction was, etc. Um, and I actually gave a talk on it, um, a couple of talks up in Scotland on it. So it was, we had pre-booked with 10 Downing Street, so they knew we were coming, um, we'd sent them the letter, we'd sent it by registered post, um, we gave them, um, 20 working days, which was one month. And then we went there and we'd, we'd phone beforehand, have you received the letter? Yes, very likely. And then, have you received the letter? We don't know. And then you go there, have you received the letter? And there's no record of the letter. Right? So then Even I go it to... it was registered. It was registered post, yeah. So then I go to present the letter physically to 10 Downing Street and they wouldn't take the letter. Right? Normally they'll just take the letter if you go there and present it, right? They wouldn't take the letter, so we had to go around to the Army and Navy stores and post it there, which is about another 15 minute walk. Now that was the 2nd of August. So what they did was they, they got hold of a copy of the book, this is 10 Downing Street and, the, and Buckingham Palace, and they studied the contents of the book using scholars, etc., and they realized that this was a legitimate and superior claim to the throne of England. Right? Greg, this is just astonishing. we got to take another break. Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal with my special guest, Greg Hallett. A truly astonishing story. We'll be right back. This is Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, continuing my conversation with Greg Hallett. You've just delivered the book. And I take it you finally got the letter, too, and the scholars have studied and concluded that there's a superior claimant to the throne of England. Yes. Yeah. So what they decided to do was <clears throat> pull a fast one. So they, uh, the, they decided that Prince William would have to get engaged and married and that they would change the laws of succession to the throne 
Really? Yes. That's what's happening. In order to circumvent this challenge to the throne, yep. to the legitimacy of the present occupant, they would change the laws yes. of succession. Yes. How stunning. You would think that's something that would never be changed. Well, um, I'll just find it for you. I'll just find the absolute details just so that I, I get the dates absolutely correct. Okay, so we delivered the book on the 2nd of August 2010 to 10 Downing, or we delivered, rather we delivered the letter, then they got hold of the book. There were about 20 copies floating around, a lot of them in Scotland. Um, and then, so um, let's say it took them to the 1st of September to study it and realize that it was a superior and genuine claim to the throne. All the photographs were genuine, all of the objects were genuine, and all of the decodification of the royal objects we had were true. So they found that we had actually done a very scholarly job. That's so, astonishing. This, this is all just astonishing, Greg. Yeah. Well, you did say I looked like a royal when you first met me. <laughs> I'd, only been, I'd, I'd only been a royal then about... Um, Three weeks, two weeks, three weeks. <laughs> well, I think your your skills in research aided you immensely here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for that. Um, so, on the second of August, letters delivered. By the first of September, two thousand and ten, they've decided that it is a legitimate and superior claim. So, Prince William is instructed to um, choose between his girlfriends which one he's going to have as a fiance, and he's got a month to do it. So he does that in September, and then all of October there's betting at Ladbrokes on Prince William getting married or getting engaged before the end of the year. And um, the the betting was was actually huge. People were making a lot of money out of it. Well, and it was actually a sure thing. Yeah, and then his engagement was announced on the 16th of November, uh, 2010. And then they tried to change the laws. And instead of uh, Prime Minister David Cameron contacting us, and we're the um, superior and legitimate royal family, um, he goes to the Commonwealth Heads of State. So I'll just find the exact details so I can read it. Commonwealth. Find. So... So David Cameron's further briefed by Queen Elizabeth that the only head of the throne of the United Kingdom would be the children of Prince Charles or the current Prince of Wales. Now, we're the true Prince of Wales and we have at least half a dozen marks to show that we are the true Prince of Wales, including acknowledgement from other royal families. Um... So, David Cameron... Uh, so, there's actually quite a bit of awareness among the aristocracies of the world that this is the case. Yeah, yeah, it's known. It's known and it's kept secret. Basically, if you reveal that Queen Victoria had a firstborn son, you're no longer part of the aristocracy. You're, you're cold-shouldered. Um, and if you... Yeah, so, basically, the, the people that knew about it, like Prime Minister... Prime Minister um, Lord Palmerston, who was Prime Minister three times for Queen Victoria, uh, he kept secret about it. But um, Lord Palmerston's uh, stepdaughter, uh, who also turned out to be his biological daughter, is called uh, Viscountess Lady Frances Jocelyn. And she was also the governess of Queen Victoria's children. So you've got Lord Palmerston going, no, Marcus Manuel can't be king. And then you've got his daughter, who was Britain's leading female photographer, photographing Marcus Manuel and doing paintings of Marcus Manuel and doing codification to show that he was the true king and not King Edward VII. Right? And that's all in the family. It's just one family. You know, the, the uh, Lord Palmerston, the, the Coopers. 
So in the um, so from the time we got the letter to 10 Downing Street on the 2nd of August 2010, um, and the time that they realised that it was real, which was uh, end of September, and then in the October when uh, Prince William was was uh, becoming engaged to commoner Kate, um, David Cameron, instead of contacting us and saying, yes, we accept your challenge to the throne, David Cameron was to secretly brief the Commonwealth heads of government and get their approval that the only heir to the throne of the United Kingdom would be the children of Prince Charles or the Prince of Wales. And to disguise this as a gender and religious issue, which would then um, gain their approval. They go, oh yeah, so firstborn daughters are, are now allowed to become a monarch and Catholics are now allowed to become the monarch. But really, it was about only Prince Charles's children could become the monarch. To so, finesse the challenge, which I gather was not even mentioned or breathed to them. No, no. So, so what, what uh, Prime Minister David Cameron has done is he's obfuscated to the Commonwealth heads of government that there is a legitimate and superior challenge to the throne. He's not allowed them to know that, right? Yeah, he's not allowed them to know that. So, uh, Prime Minister David Cameron has to resign. He is not acting on the best interests of the country, uh, nor is he acting on the best interests of the monarchy. And he this is a current is, issue right now today. Yeah. Right? So, so he he is instilling a he's he's trying to instill a fake monarchy in perpetuity. Uh, is it in Britain, which which means that the mafia who knows the secret, then um, twists the royal family to go to war wherever they want and sell arms and deal drugs, and they'll go, well, we won't get caught because we know the monarchy's fake. So he see it, does, it, does, it does leave them liable to blackmail. I don't think yeah. there's any doubt. Yeah, so it's very important that you have a true monarch, and part of the reason why we've had so many wars from 1852 to now is because... The British monarchy that's fake has been signing off those wars to allow them to happen. See, the British monarchy has to sign a paper to send its country into war. And so any any defence department that wants to go to war, or any group that wants to go to war, can do it and get the royal approval because the, the royal family is fake. Flat lie royal. This is really truly an astonishing story, Greg. Yeah, it's a big one. So, um, have, have, have any of the press picked up on any of this? No, I've actually spoken to the press about it, and they've they've gone uh, silent. They've just gone absolutely silent. But there's more. There's more. So, under Wikipedia, alternative successions of the English crown. Quote: On twenty eighth of October two thousand eleven. During the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth, Australia, it was announced that British Prime Minister David Cameron's proposed changes to the royal succession laws in the 16 Commonwealth realms had received unanimous support of the other realms' Prime Ministers. The alterations would replace male preference primogeniture, under which sons take precedence over daughters in the lines of succession, with absolute primogenitor for descendants of the current Prince of Wales, end the ban on marriage of dynasts to Catholics, and limit the requirement for those in line to the throne to acquire permission of the sovereign to marry. However, the requirement of the sovereign to be in communion with the Church of England would remain. The Queen Elizabeth II is said to support the proposed changes. Well, she actually made sure they happened. The main point there is with absolute primogenitor for the descendants of the current Prince of Wales. Yeah, to preclude any challenge to the crown from any other source on any other basis. Yeah, they've actually... Um, Re reg regardless of the strength or legitimacy of the claim. They've actually shot themselves in the foot there because Prince William's father isn't Prince Charles. It's, really? It's King Juan Carlos of Spain. Prince William's father is actually... Yeah. 
Yeah. Who and and um, King Juan Carlos of Spain actually runs New Zealand. New Zealand is uh, bankrupt. Um, so the country can't be bankrupt. So, so he had a dalliance with Elizabeth. I mean, this no, was no, a he had dalliance with uh, uh, Princess Diana. Oh, with Diana, of course. Yeah, yeah Diana, of course. Yeah. William Diana, yes, of course. So, um, and, that, and and that was while she was married to Prince Charles, of course. I absolutely, absolutely. And while Charles was still longing for Car Camilla. Absolutely, yep. And um, and Diana was not too pleased by all of that. No, 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 no. She said there's three people in this marriage. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, um, and Prince... Um, so the uh, fact Prince, that William Prince is Harry, not the son, yeah. Prince Harry is the son of um, Hewitt. That, yes. He but, looks so much like him. However... Uh, no one has any doubt about that, do they? But ha However, Prince Charles does have two children. And they're not Prince William and they're not Prince Harry. So they would technically, under this new arrangement, be eligible to become the, the, the crown? Well, that's why they've shot themselves in the foot, because neither Prince William or Prince Harry are Prince Charles' children, right? But Prince Harry has two children, but neither of them are legitimate, and neither of them are princes or princesses. <laughs> it's quite a mess, isn't it? Yeah, so um, Prince Charles uh, was dating Camilla. They fancied each other from when they were quite young. Um, they were dating each other when they were 16 and 17. Camilla's actually older. So yes. Camilla, Camilla was 17, right? Yeah. And Prince Charles was 16. And on Camilla Parker Bowles' 18th birthday, they conceived a child. On her 18th birthday? Yeah, on her 18th birthday, yep. And um, that child was um, adopted out by a royal servant. It was a royal servant. His daughter raised the child. And that child um, looked like Prince Charles and looked like Camilla Parker Bowles. So when he was seven, he was drugged um, with, uh, what's that, that date rohypnol, the date rape drug. Rohypnol. Yeah. And it, had, uh, it was in grapefruit juice, which actually increases the, uh, the intensity of the drug, but leaves less of a trace. Did it kill him? No, 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 no. His he he was his eyes were injected with pigment to change them from blue to brown. Oh, his oh. and then and later his ears were pinned back, and um, later his front teeth were ground off. You know, ground right down. Yeah. So he didn't look like Prince Charles or Camilla, and um, he, he grew up in Gosport. I mean, was he aware these things were happening to him? He must have known. His eye color had changed. His ears were different. His teeth were different. Yeah, he said when his, when his eye, eye color was changed, when he was seven, um, when he woke up, he was just screaming because it was like someone was rubbing sandpaper across his eyes. Yes. And he's now a um, telecommunications engineer in Australia. Um, Is he aware of his birth? Yeah. Yeah, and he's... Um, uh, just before Kate and Will's wedding, he put out an email probably a couple of days beforehand. Uh, his name's Simon Charles Day, um, saying that you know he was the he was the illegitimate son of um, Prince Charles and Camilla Parker Bowles, and uh, he's married to a Tory straight Islander, which is sort of half Aborigine, half Papua New Guinea, and she's she's very black, she's a very black woman. And they had six kids, and <clears throat> five are still alive. So what uh, Princess Diana did was um, fly out to Australia and uh, be photographed holding all these Tory Strait Islander children. <laughs> Which was a kind of that, that, that he had begot, yeah. What's that? That he had had with this black woman. Yeah, yeah. These were, the, was actually, these were the, cho the, yeah. the children. These were, were actually, his children she was holding. Yeah, so to Princess Diana, they were her stepchildren, you know, if they were those ones that he was holding, that she was holding. So she goes to Australia and holds up all these Tory Strait Islander and Aboriginal um, uh, black children, and the Queen goes, 
Well, you know, they could actually be my grandchildren. <clears throat> so it was another reason to kill her because she knew that. And uh, Prince Charles. Another was, reason to kill Diana. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was it was ruled an unlawful killing. Her death was ruled an unlawful killing. The automobile event in Paris. Yeah, yeah. Now, Prince an Charles, unlawful killing. Yeah. You know, I haven't. I'm not aware of that until now, Greg. Yeah. No, it's it's there. I thought the official claim was it had been an accident. No, uh, there was another hearing in France. It was ruled un unlawful killing. Yeah. An unlawful killing. That sounds an awful lot like murder. Yeah, it does. You know, for royal murders, it's called an unlawful killing. Um, Have they determined the responsibility? Does it go right back to the crown? Then does it go to Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip? Um, well, a lot of people have pointed the finger at Prince Philip. A lot. Really? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, really. Really. Now, Prince Charles had another illegitimate child with a maid in Balmoral Castle. Um, uh, from memory, conceived in 1967, born in 1968. So, you know, what they're saying with this Commonwealth heads of government, with, with Prime Minister David Cameron dealing with the Commonwealth heads of government on 28th of October 2011, is that uh, they want to put either the daughter, the, the child of a maid with Prince Charles on the throne, or um, Prince Charles and Camilla's child on the throne when they, when neither of them were married. So an illegitimate child, and it was interesting that when the, when the guy got married, when Simon Charles Day got married, um, it was one hundred and thirty one dollars fifty for the wedding, and the, there's just no there's no support or contact or acknowledgement from either Prince Charles or Camilla. Basically, just cold shouldered them of, of of their son marrying this Aboriginal woman. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is fairly brutal, isn't it? Yeah, well, you know, they've got a lot to hide. They're pretty lazy. Prince Charles is pretty lazy. Like, he's got a lot of um, charity events to attend. He's got a lot of people have said, you know, we've organized this charity event. You said you'd come, and can you come? It's at 5 o'clock on such and such a day. And everyone's paid huge amounts of their, for their ticket because, you know, supposedly the Prince of Wales is going to turn up. He doesn't even, I've bother, heard that doesn't even bother to turn up. I've heard there's a lot of sentiment for, for skipping Prince Charles and going directly to William. Yeah, there is, but William's illegitimate. So what's going to happen is that... Um, so the, the true Queen of England at the moment is Olga Maria. And she's, <clears throat> she's 81 and a half. Um, I've, I've uh, spoken to her. She's got a beautiful, beautiful speaking voice of about a 40-year-old, 35, 40-year-old, absolutely beautiful voice. And, you know, she takes a, a, a really good photograph. She absolutely looks royal. And her son is Francisco Manuel, who is the true Prince of Wales. And it's Francisco Manuel that I've been working with. This is all just astonishing. I just don't see how they get it straight, Greg. They, they're going to play on the popular belief that, you know, the apparent... They, they're not going to admit William or Harry is not legitimate. Are they? I just can't see how they could do it. Well, the entire public knows that, that Harry's not legitimate, and therefore he's not a prince, you know, because he's the daughter of, of Princess Diana, who is... Um, a princess by marriage to Prince Charles, who's also a fake prince. So Prince Harry is not really a prince. But there's no doubt that they're going to leave that as the popular impression, isn't it? I mean... Well, you know, <laughs> the media is absolutely you know, dedicated to having a royal family that they can photograph. I'm, I'm on the air. <clears throat> and um, so what, what they do is, is just continue with a, with, a, with a fake royal family and, and, 
and say wonderful things about them and photograph them turning up. But they know they're a fake. They know they're a fraud. And they've known they're a fraud since at least 1910 when King Edward VII murdered his older brother, Marcos Manuel. You know, and it was only, it was only, um, only five months ago, that I, four months ago, that I found the grave. Why, why was it that the firstborn son of Queen Victoria was excluded from succession? Yeah, now that, that's an interesting point. And it goes like this. Princess Victoria married blind Prince George of Cumberland and had a child, Marcus Manuel. That legitimized Victoria as a princess. Then there was an arranged marriage with a homosexual. And then the Rothschild, Lionel Nathan Rothschild, who was known as the King of Kings, conceived all of Queen Victoria's official nine children. Really? Yeah. And then they were all married off at a young age, sort of. And what, what was his official role in relation to the Queen at that point in time? He owned the Bank of England. Yeah, but I mean, he... he there was no legal. I mean, this was all out of wedlock. I mean, this was all, you know, these were petards, as you're describing them. Batard, B, B for Bob, batards. Batard, Bat yes. Bastards, batards. Yeah. But, so with, with, the, with the royal family being illegitimate, they were married off at young ages, like 18, 19 to 22. I think the oldest was 27. And they were married off all around Europe which meant that when the Rothschilds had the knowledge that all of these families and their descendants were illegitimate, they had total control over them to send their nations into war. And then the Rothschilds would supply money to both sides of the war and make huge profits on their loans. So this is yet another reason why the Rothschilds' families become so powerful, because of the siring of all these Ill illegitimate queen children by Queen Victoria. Yes, yes. Um, and also they they were the ones behind the delay in history, the 200 year delay in history from 1812 to 2012. And particularly the 19th of December, uh, 19th of September 2012. And thereafter. Greg, we're going to take our final break and then come back and talk about this delay in history. And I believe you have a book on uh, Lord Mountbatten that you've just completed. Am I yeah, right? Lord, Lord Mountbatten, yes. It's called The Final Mountbatten Report. Christopher Robin Goes to War. Most secret. We'll be right back. Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal with Greg Hallett. You don't want to miss. Be right back. Greg, i got to check something and then we'll do the yeah, final. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Your, your knowledge of genealogy is just phenomenal, Greg. Do you yeah. have a photographic memory? Um, you just have a really good memory. <laughs> no, I live it. I, I, I'm doing this. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually in the royal family, and I'm doing it. This is my job, yeah. you know? Absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so, um, wait, I, yeah, I've got to start us again. Yeah. Okay. This is uh, Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal, concluding my conversation with Greg Hallett. If you haven't learned things you didn't know before, I don't know where you've been, because this is astonishing stuff, Greg. Okay, um, so I'm just trying to trying to think where we're up to. Yeah, well, so... Well, you explained how, you know, the Rothschilds, had, uh, the, the, the head of the Bank of England had had all these children, batards, yeah. by yeah. Victoria... And I was observing that that's one more reason why they've had so much influence in the world is, you know, yeah. having all this intimate knowledge of the history of the royal family and where the skeletons are buried. I mean, this is just astonishing stuff. Yeah, yeah. But then you have the new book, too. So, Greg, we want to, however, you know, you mentioned that Diana... It was a was a a wrongful killing. Was that how you put Un, it? Unlawful killing. Unlawful it killing. It was actually ruled by a judge as an unlawful killing. Which sounds to me an awful lot like murder. And you're saying it's the polite term for murder if it's done by a royal family. Yeah, yeah. 
So, um, by Princess we Diana um, holding up the Tory Strait Islander children, she was saying to Queen Elizabeth, these are your grandchildren. Yes. Right? Yeah. And when we put pressure on the British monarchy by delivering a letter saying we have a legitimate and superior claim to the throne. Yes. Uh, Prince William was then forced to engage and marry. And then Prime Minister David Cameron went around to the Commonwealth heads of government and said, uh, we want to allow Catholics, we want to allow firstborn girls to be the monarch, and we want to allow... Uh, all, uh, all the only monarch can be the uh, descendant of Prince Charles. Yeah, the claiming that you know, pretending as though this were a liberalization when actually it was a surreptitious act to preclude a challenge to the throne that would actually probably succeed. Yeah, she did say that the descendants of the current Prince of Wales would be the monarch, which is interesting because the current Prince of Wales is Francisco Manuel, and. Um, yeah. Um, and oh, well, that, that might be a, a, a legal entree, might it not? I mean, that well, sounds like a might be a powerful position to argue. Yeah, well, what's interesting is that, um, like, I'm, I'm his adopted son, um, which, which and, and his, his firstborn son is still quite young. Uh, he's still a, still a child. So I'm, I'm here in England acting on behalf of the true royal family as the proxy to the monarch and the proxy to the Prince of Wales. Um, and I've invited um, Francisco Manuel to England and his family's advised him that it's too dangerous for him to be here. So, sure, it might be, they, they might try to kill him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the risk of assassination could be very high. Yeah, he's got he's got he's got um, British spies all over him in Portugal. But it was interesting that when we were writing together for six weeks in two thousand and ten, March to May two thousand and ten, we we're, were based in a French style chateau, and um, guards appeared on horseback, and no one recognised the uniform. Guards appeared on horseback to protect him and you. Uh, it looks that way. And a, and well, that's a, pretty damn interesting. Yeah, in a uniform that no one recognised, and there's another man with a with a dog, and the dog was a unique breed of um, uh, Samoyed husky. Yeah. And the Rothschilds um, love to breed and breed hybrids and breed new species. Like their latest conquest is the world's biggest or tallest giraffe which actually has three horns um, so we think that the Rothschilds were actually guarding us well that's quite stunning isn't it yeah yeah I mean what do you make of that what what, what would be the interest of the Rothschilds in guarding you well um, the Rothschilds were uh, um, well, Lionel Nathan Rothschild was the father of all Queen Victoria's children. But Lionel, not Ra Lionel Nathan Rothschild's father, Nathan May Rothschild, who took over the Bank of England after the Battle of Waterloo, he took it over between the 18th and the 22nd of June, 1815. Um, 1815. Um, he he uh, funded the... Duke of Kent and Strathen out of his bankruptcy and allowed him to keep the Duke of Kent and Strathen in the stole to which he was accustomed, which was getting drunk a lot, spent a lot of money on whores and mistresses. So Nathan Mayer Rothschild is actually the biological father of Queen Victoria. The biological father of Queen Victoria. Yeah, with um, the Duchess of Kent and Strathen, who was known as Victoire, Victoire Louise. So that meant that Victoria, as a princess, was not a legitimate princess. So to legitimise Victoria, because they were very short on on um, on uh, descendants, on children, on on legitimate children 
of royals eligible to the throne. So much so there was actually a breeding race for British royals at that time. So Queen Victoria and Prince Consort Albert won. So Victoria became a legitimate princess by marrying blind Prince George of Cumberland and having a child with him, which was Marcos Manuel. And then for all the rest of her children, Victoria was married to um, Prince Consort Albert, who was a homosexual and wore the, uh, the Prince Albert, which was stopped him from having intercourse. And <clears throat> Prince Albert was completely compromised and he would hold Victoria's hand while she was given Baron Dunga, which is the old witch's herbal name for scopolamine, which is an inhibition inhibitor. And um, Lionel Nathan Rothschild was the father of all of Queen Victoria's legitimate children. And that explains the hemophilia in the royal family down to a T. They could never work out how the hemophilia was introduced into the British royal family. And that's how it was introduced. By the Rothschilds. Yeah. Now, Marcus Manuel doesn't have it. He doesn't have it. So, yeah. So now, have, 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 have members of the royal family then died because of it? Um, well, they've, they've, they've faked their deaths in the name of it. Um, they've been sick with it. Um, I'm not sure if they've died with it. Now, this this whole operation. Do, 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 yeah. Does 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 Charles have hemophilia? I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. Because um, King George V was uh, supposedly the son of um, King Edward VII and uh, Princess Alexandrina, uh, at Princess Alexandra. Um, but Princess Alexandra had an affair with the person who became Tsar Alexander III. And um, conceived... King George the Fifth, so that introduced new blood. <clears throat> so Non-hemophilic. So th this whole this whole um, operation has been going since the European Wars, which started in about 1794 and ended around about 1815, 1820, and. Um, it looks like the shin, the secret of the, of the shin was, was taken from Portugal and the European wars were at least partly centered in Portugal. Uh, General um, William Carr Beresford was there. He was great friends with uh, the Duke of Saldana, who was, and the, both of them were great friends with the Duke of Wellington, friends, and, and um, they'd go to war together, the generals. <clears throat> So the breeding plan for the legitimate male monarch of England, of uh, the United Kingdom, um, was a secret actually before Princess Victoria was even born. And when she was born a girl, it was delayed a generation, namely 14 years. So um, Princess Victoria gave birth to Marcus Manuel when she was 14. And at that time, the legal age to marry, conceive, and uh, was 12. <clears throat> so it, it looks like my um, Portuguese ancestors had cargo ships. And they were the ones who took the secret to the farthest sides of the well, farthest place away on the planet. And that was uh, New Zealand. So they, they settled in the very bottom of New Zealand. There's, you've got the North Island, you've got the South Island, and you've got Stewart Island. And off that, there's a very, very small island, which had no name. So they settled there, and they named it Bravo Island. And on the sailing journey from Lisbon and Portugal, um, the last Portuguese landmark that you see is Bravo Island. So they named the little island off the bottom of New Zealand, Bravo Island. And they had uh, 22 children and 21 survived. 
And the number for the shin, the number for the forbidden secret, is 21. Um, <clears throat> so the idea was that one of their descendants, who turned out to be me, would be the one who would uncover the secret and put the true royal family back on the throne. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. Now, now, David Cameron, of course, has been very skillful in negotiating this these changes to the line of succession, but it does appear that there are certain legal vulnerabilities there, some of which you indicated in passing. Well, he, he hasn't um, given full disclosure to the Commonwealth Heads of Government. He's obfuscated that we have a legitimate claim to the throne, and Francisco Manuel has been writing memorandums to the Queen, to Queen Elizabeth II, or as he calls her, Elizabeth II, because she's not the Queen. He's been writing to her since um, at least 2000, if not 1997. And those That's he really? Yeah, yeah, and those are actually listed. Uh, there's a big list of memorandums in the back of the book. Um, there's about two pages just listing the titles of the memorandums. One was on, to Queen Elizabeth, was on 12 December 2003, 1st of March 2009, David Cameron, 25th November 2009. Um, uh, David Cameron, 6th October 2009, 14 October 2009. Queen Elizabeth II, uh, his first one was 6th of March 1997. So since 1997, uh, Queen Elizabeth has been aware that Francisco Manuel has a legitimate claim to the throne as the Prince of Wales, and that his mother, Olga Maria, um, which is actually a, a very true royal name, and the Russians will recognize that if someone's called Olga Maria, and especially without a surname, that's the name of a true royal. Um, yeah, so uh, the Queen Elizabeth's yeah. been aware of it since 1997, um, and there's been a huge amount of pressure on me. Um, since winter solstice 1999 so since for me in the southern hemisphere that was the 22nd of june 1999 huge amount of pressure on me just trying to uh, uh, remove all my assets destroy my career throw me in the courts all the time for trumped up charges on just nothing absolutely no justice and 12 murder what? attempts in new zealand all because you're more or less the point man for the legitimate successor to the crown. Yeah, yeah. And I, I actually have paperwork to show that I'm um, Lord Chancellor to the true King of England. And we've got the, um, we've used the seal of the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, and the, the High Court of Auckland uh, Refused to see it. And I was, I was even holding it up in court, and the judge just wouldn't look. You know, he's just looking away. Looking really, 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 really. Yeah. I was even holding really? the book up. I was even holding. Look, I'm really? Kind of... That's just astounding. That's just astounding. <laughs> this is in. Uh... This is astounding. <laughs> this is in February 2011. I'm even holding this book up, The Hidden King of England, saying, "Look, I'm a co-author with with His Royal Highness um, Francisco Manuel." And he just want to look. He looks and just sees it. I'm holding a book, but wouldn't wouldn't accept it as a court document because the Queen apparently owns all the court buildings, and all of the judges judge according to the right given to them by the Queen. And the Queen's fake, which is why our courts are now just supporting the mafia, and they don't support honest people. They can't settle a debt. All they do is support the mafia because the mafia has control of the, the monarchy because the monarchy is fake. This is a ghastly situation. Well, if you think about it, it's the last um, 150 years of history. Britain going to war, conquering countries and doing all these dastardly deeds, you know, in the name of Britannia. <clears throat> Now the United States has become the greatest aggressor nation in the world, Greg. Yeah, but the United States is just a British plantation. <laughs> it is. Legally, it's a British plantation, and it's run from the Temple Bar in the center of London, the Square Mile of London. And the, uh, the huge dragon, it's about a four-meter-high black dragon with its wings spread. And yeah. uh, that is the Temple Bar marker. 
it's actually called the Temple Bar Marker. I've seen the dragon. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so um, that's interesting. <laughs> and so now I've got um, this book here. Um, the final Mount yes. Hatton report, Christopher Robin Goes to War. And um, The Hidden King is coming out shortly. So at the moment I'm selling the final Mountbatten report, which is about Lord Louis Mountbatten. And I've got the background on Mountbatten. Uh, and part of it is he was, he was the nephew of um, uh, Princess Beatrice Battenberg, um, who gave him the, the royal secrets. And um, so what Lord Louis Mountbatten did is he got his nephew... Prince Philip to, uh, he introduced, Lord Louis Mountbatten introduced Prince Philip, who was then Prince Philippos of Greece and Denmark, and he introduced her to Princess Elizabeth um, on the 22nd of July 1939. Now, Lord Louis Mountbatten came to own Broadlands, which is this huge mansion on 5,000 acres. 25 miles north of Portsmouth. Uh, he came to own that 18 days before, um, on the 3rd of July, 1939. Now, in Broadlands, Broadlands used to be owned by Lady Viscountess Frances Jocelyn's parents. And then it passed to her brother, and then to her nephew, and it went down to Lady Edwina Mountbatten and Lord Louis Mountbatten. And as the male, Lord Louis Mountbatten came to own it. Now, Viscountess Frances Jocelyn was the governess of all of Queen Victoria's children, including Marquis Manuel, up until the ages of six months. And we think that it was Viscountess Frances Jocelyn who delivered the chest full of royal marks to Marquis Manuel in Lisbon. In Portugal. And these were royal marks from Queen Victoria, some of which she'd made herself, which codified that Marcus Manuel was the true King of England. So, Viscountess Frances Jocelyn was England's best known female photographer and one of the first female photographers. And she took all the photos of Marcus Manuel that we've got, and we've also got some childhood photos of. King Edward VII, his younger brother, who's standing there with a broken rod. So she left this painting in Broadlands. Lord Louis Mountbatten came into ownership of Broadlands on the 3rd of July 1939. He'd already heard about it, but he didn't have concrete proof. He'd already heard about Marcus Manuel, but he didn't have concrete proof. And this painting gave him concrete proof. So he used that information and he got his nephew, Prince Philippos of Greece and Denmark, to meet Princess Elizabeth, and then they became secretly engaged 1946 to 47, and then they became officially engaged in 1947, and Prince Philip revealed the family secret that they were illegitimate to Prince uh, to um, Princess Elizabeth's father, King George VI, and King George VI was not very bright. And he was compromised. So he approved the engagement with Prince Philip and Princess Elizabeth. Um, and then they were married. And they were married on the condition that Prince Philip get the royal marks back off us. Get all the royal marks and, and obliterate any history of Marcus Manuel. So being uh, Prince Philip became the head of the Navy. And he used his Navy intelligence connections to turn a Portuguese intelligence agent in Portugal who was a, a, a member of the, the true royal family in Portugal. His name was uh, Jose Carlos. And in 1968, he stole the Queen Victoria's Blue copybook, which was uh, Queen Victoria's birth records of Marcos Manuel, including things like his birth weight, um, 
time and day he was born, place he was born, the usual birth records, um, and and also her time with Marcos Manuel in the first uh, five and a half months of his life, five five and a half months, <clears throat> and then he also got the baby clothes with the um, royal insignia on it, and he got the royal baby rattle. Um, and that was out of an, an apartment in Lisbon. And he took those to uh, Prince Philip. And that was the first and only information, only bit of the raw marks that Prince Philip got. Prince Philip showed those to Lord Louis Mountbatten. Lord Louis Mountbatten showed them to Peter Sellers, his son. And then Peter Sellers made being there, which is... Peter Sellers summary of all the scuttlebutt that he knew of um, of Marcus Manuel from his father Lord Louis Mountbatten and from his great aunt Princess Beatrice Battenberg who was Queen Victoria's youngest daughter and secretary in charge of uh, rewriting all of Queen Victoria's diaries and letters to exclude her to first exclude Marcus Manuel, to exclude blind Prince George of Cumberland, and who was, became blind King George V of Hanover. Now, historians do mention George in the in Queen Victoria's diaries, and they never knew what it meant, um, and they've never been able to work out what the what the constant love for George was. And George was blind. Prince George of Cumberland, blind King George V of Hanover, and it was her first husband, and they were married their entire lives. They never divorced. And when Queen Victoria, she grew up playing with the Hanover crown jewels, and <clears throat> she married um, the man who became King George V of Hanover when she was 14 and she didn't give up the Hanover crown jewels for 30 years she retained them for 30 years and she used to wear the Hanover crown in her time off to celebrate her marriage to George Greg I'm going to have to have you back time passes too quickly this is just astounding stuff yeah well you can get me I tell you what I've got my I've now got my first bank account in two years I actually have not been allowed to have a bank account so mind you we're, my, we're still we're, we're still winding down is there anything you'd like to add as a final yeah, observation yeah. you can find out you can see my elevation to Lord Chancellor on the world of truth .net. Worldoftruth.net. Yes, you can order the final Mountbatten report. I know we haven't spoken about it much, but you can order the final Mountbatten report, which is 380 pages hardback. Um, it's got a beautiful, um, beautiful cover. Yep. Um, yeah. So it's got a gold ribbon in it, and it's it's got maps in it, and it's just it's a, it's, a, it's a really good book. It's a very good read. It's the forerunner to Operation James Bond. It's going to be officially announced by the royal family on the 27th of September, 2012. But they won't be announcing the other book. <laughs> um, and Is so that going I'm, to be available I'm, to the public? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, you can place book orders at theworldoftruth.net. So one word, theworldoftruth.net. And you can contact me at Lord Chancellor UK at gmail.com. Lord, Lord Chancellor UK at gmail.com. Yep. And if you want to, you can actually, um, if you've got a PayPal account, you can actually pay into that account and make pre orders. Greg, and you're fantastic. I can't thank you enough for being here, my friend. And I'm looking forward to having you back. I mean, this is just an education all by itself, I got to tell you. <laughs> the last 150 years of history, especially revolving around the crown and the royal family. Yeah, yeah. It's been Jim, interesting. Jim Fetzer, your host on The Real Deal. Thank you, my special guest, the 
Lord Chancellor. Lord Chancellor. In, in, in waiting, as it were. <laughs> Amazing stuff. Greg Hallett and all of you for listening. Greg, are they going to try to stop the book? Which one? Four sabotage print runs. I'm exiled out of my own country. They've tried to sabotage the print run? I'm stateless. I'm stateless. Stateless. You know? Can't go back to New Zealand. I'll just get killed there. They've already said that. You're stateless, yes. They've got 30, 30 fake charges um, held at the police station, internal affairs agents. Have can, get, the can, get, can you get the book out? I mean, it's going to be oh, a yeah, sensation. I can get the book out, yeah. Except, except, except. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic, man. I've never understood your story so well as when you gave it today. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I find it's good to just break things down, you know. But really, uh, uh, there's a whole lot of topics I didn't cover. You know, we can do another interview. Yeah. Much, you know. We'll do another one. Yeah. Yeah. It's just time to come out, you know, because the 19th of September is creeping up. You know, and yeah, that, date, that was the date for the challenge. That's the date when the 200-year delay in history ends. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Do you know anyone at the Washington Post? Mm, I don't actually. I mean, you think they'd like this story? Yeah, because yeah, because uh, Peter Sellers being their movie codifies that the Washington Post is the place to release the story. <laughs> 